Hello fellow history nerds and welcome to the first ever episode of the Bold Historian Podcast. The aim of this podcast is to educate and entertain. So I hope you'll enjoy the journey we take through the world story. So episode one of season one will focus on the invasion of England by William of Normandy and Harold III of Norway. We will also focus on Harold Godbenson, who was King of the English in 1066 at the time of the invasion. So a rundown of today's episode. We will focus on the three characters. First of all, we will meet Harold Hardrada, King of Norway. And then we will meet Harold Godbenson, King of the English. And then lastly, we will have a look at William the Bastard, also known to us nowadays as William the Conqueror. At the time, he was Duke of Normandy. Let's meet Harold Hardrada. Hedrada was born in 1015 in Ringerike in Norway. His mother was Asta Gudbrandsdatter, and his father was Sigurd Sir, king of Ringerike, a petty kingdom in what is now Norway. Hedrada's father died in 1018 when Harold was only three. Snorri Sturluson, an Icelandic historian, described Harold as huge in stature with a large upper beard. At 15 years old, Harold fought in his first battle, the Battle of Stiklestad, in 1030, on the side of his brother, Olaf Haraldsson. Olaf sought to claim the thrones of Norway, Denmark and England from Canute the Great. This may be a contributor factor in Harold's decision to claim the throne of England. The kingdoms of Norway, Denmark and England are now collectively referred to as the North Sea Empire. Not strictly an empire, all three kingdoms were united under a personal union of Canute the Great. However, even though he held the crown of all three kingdoms, all three were their own separate political entities. Canute is now buried at Winchester Cathedral. So back to Harold. So his brother Olaf was defeated by Canute and Olaf was actually killed at the Battle of Stiklestad. Harold then went on the run for a year in Norway before going into exile and went to live in the Kievan Rus state in Eastern Europe. The Kievan Rus were descendants of mainly Swedish Vikings who explored and raided along the major rivers of far Eastern Europe. So, under the protection of the Kievan Rus leader Yaroslav the Wise, Harold soon became a captain in Yaroslav's army. Yaroslav had also hosted Olaf, Harold's brother, who was also in exile years back. So Harold stayed in the Kievan Rus until about 1034, upon which he left his wealth under the protection of Yaroslav and then journeyed to Constantinople, which the Norse called Miklagard. And there he further increased his reputation as a warrior by serving in the Viking-dominated Varangian Guard. So the Varangians were the household bodyguard unit of the Eastern Roman Emperor, and they were also elite troops who fought in the armies of the Empire. Whilst in the Varangian Guard, Harold was at the forefront of the Empire's military ventures, fighting in several theatres and against a variety of foes, such as Arab pirates in the Mediterranean, the Moors in the reconquest of Sicily by the Roman Empire, in the Holy Land against Muslims, and in Bulgaria. In 1042, Harold left the service of the Varangian Guard, stopped off in the Kievan Rus state to collect his wealth, and then went on to Norway. As a battle-hardened veteran of the Varangians, he was determined to seize the throne of Norway. Harold's nephew Magnus was King of Norway and King of Denmark at this time, so in order to gain enough strength and support to be able to challenge for the throne of Norway, Harold allied himself with Sven of Denmark, who was a claimant to the Danish throne, by virtue of being the nephew of Canute the Great. Fortunately, Harold's nephew Magnus did not want to fight, so instead they struck a deal. In return for half of Harold's wealth, Magnus would agree for Harold to be co-ruler of Norway. This works out well for Harold as Magnus died not long after, and on his deathbed Magnus claimed his possessions should be divided between Harold and Sven. Harold becomes king of Norway, and Sven became king of Denmark. For the next 20 years, Harold ruled Norway. He was plagued by the odd uprising rebellion, and it is said Harold gained his moniker of Hadrada, which means hard ruler, because of a particularly brutal suppression of an uprising. During his reign as King of Norway, Harold raided Denmark. Harold claimed the Danish throne, and him and his former ally Svein became enemies. Harold's claim was unsuccessful, and he eventually gave up. And then we come to 1066. So in 1066, Tostig, the brother of Harold, King of the English, arrived in Norway in an attempt to persuade Harold to seize the throne of England from Harold Godbenson. So an uprising had occurred in Northumbria, Tostig was Earl of Northumbria, and to come to a peaceful resolution of the uprising, Edward the Confessor struck Tostig of his earldom. Tostig went into exile in Flanders, he raided the Isle of Wight, and eventually he found himself in Norway. Tostig had publicly accused his brother of being responsible for him losing his earldom. 
and let's meet Harold Corpenson and we will look at his life leading up to 1066. So Harold Corpenson was born in 1022 to Godwin, Earl of Wessex and Githa, Thorkell's daughter, a Danish noblewoman. Harold's sister Edith was the wife of Edward the Confessor and therefore she was Queen Consort of England. Harold was one of nine siblings. His family had a strong connection to Denmark. One of Harold's maternal uncles was Ulf the Jarl. Ulf was father to the aforementioned Sven II of Denmark. So here we can see how the North Sea Empire, a collection of three kingdoms ruled by Canute the Great, had forged close familial ties between England and Denmark especially. And Harold's family also had close ties to Canute the Great. So when Harold was born, his father Godwin was a thane in Anglo-Saxon England. A thane is a minor noble title, and they were generally leaders of shires. His father Godwin also held the office of elderman, and elderman is the root word of the modern-day word, alderman. So during the reign of Canute the Great, England was reorganised into earldoms, the main ones being Northumbria, Mercia, East Anglia, and of course Wessex. And these were modelled on the most prominent Anglo-Saxon kingdoms before the unification of England. Godwin was appointed as Earl of Wessex in 1018. Skipping forward to 1044, 1045, Harold was appointed as Earl of East Anglia. So back then, Earl was more of a job title, an appointment made by a king rather than a rank of nobility. Although, as we know, it grew into that rank of nobility. So being an Earl came with great responsibility and power. So following Canute's death in 1035, he was succeeded by his son Harold Harefoot. Harold reigned for only five years, dying in 1040, and he was in turn succeeded by his brother, Harthur Canute and Harthur Canute died in 1042. He was succeeded by Edward the Confessor, half-brother to Harthur Canute, through his mother, Emma of Normandy. We can now see how complicated the dynastic politics of the North Sea and further beyond really were. So as Earl of East Anglia, there is evidence that Harold led a fleet of ships based at Sandwich that intercepted a raiding force from across the North Sea and pushed them back. So whilst Earl of East Anglia, Harold married Edith the Fair, an heiress of lands in Cambridgeshire, Essex and Suffolk, and these were all counties within Harold's earldom of East Anglia. As mentioned earlier, being an Earl came with great responsibility. So in 1049, Harold again led a fleet of ships, but this time it was in alliance with the Holy Roman Emperor in an effort to quash a rebellion by Baldwin V, who was Count of Flanders, the vassal of the Emperor. Again, this highlights the interconnected nature of Northern European noble families. Baldwin's daughter was married to William of Normandy. Also of note, Judith of Flanders, Baldwin's sister, was married to Tostig Godwinson, and she happened to be the cousin of William of Normandy. So back to England, and in 1051, Harold's father fell out of favour with Edward the Confessor, so Godwin was sent into exile, and Harold joined him. In 1052, they returned to claim their titles and status. The following year, in 1053, Godwin died, Eldon of Wessex, passed to Harold. As Harold was already Earl of East Anglia, this title was then passed on to Aelfgar, who happened to be the son of the Earl of Mercia. This was most likely an attempt by Edward the Confessor to break the power of the Gorbinson family. This didn't last long. Aelfgar was exiled in 1055, and Harold's brother, Gerth, assumed the earldom of East Anglia until his death. Around about the same time, Tostig became Earl of Northumbria. So once again, the Godwin family the most powerful family in Anglo-Saxon England. 1055 was a year of increasing power for the brothers Godwinson. Harold had managed to beat back the Welsh from Hereford in 1055, and as mentioned, he was rewarded with the Earldom of Hereford in 1058. The first creation of the Earldom of Hereford was actually given to Harold's brother Sven in 1048, but he died in 1052. So Alderic Vitalis, an Anglo-Norman monk and historian, who was born in 1075, described Harold Godwinson as, quote, distinguished by his great size and strength of body, his polished manners, his firmness of mind, and command of words, unquote. By 1058, Harold, by virtue of him holding the earldoms of Hereford and Wessex, and his brothers also holding the earldoms of East Anglia and Northumbria, was the most powerful man of England, even going so far as to say he most likely held more power and influence than the king, Edward the Confessor. Another reason why Harold could be considered more powerful than the king was down to the Witan. The Witan was a council that consisted of the most senior nobles and churchmen throughout the kingdom, and they grew increasingly concerned over the growing Norman influence over the king. Edward the Confessor was part Norman. His mother was Emma of Normandy, who was the sister of William of Normandy's grandfather. Edward also spent a number of years in exile, in which it is believed he lived mainly in Normandy. 
However, there is no evidence of Edward living in exile in Normandy until 1030, so we could possibly place him in Normandy from 1030 until 1042, a period of 12 years in which he could have grown close to William of Normandy. As a side note, we need to understand that Edward had a nephew who also lived in exile, but in Hungary. When Edward was king, he found out that his nephew was still alive and made plans to bring him back to England and actually nominated him to become his successor as king of the English. However, a few days after landing in England and before meeting the king, Edward the exile died. It is also possible that Howard Godwinson had a part to play in the negotiations to bring Edward back to England. Edward the Exile had a young son named Edgar Atheling, but we shall meet him in a later episode. So back to Harold. It is thought that whilst on a voyage to an unknown destination, Harold became shipwrecked in northern France in Pontieu. Here he was held hostage by the local lord, Count Guy I of Pontieu, and Guy was a vassal of Duke William of Normandy. And upon hearing of Harold being held hostage by Guy, William at once demanded his release. So, William may have seen this as an opportunity to gain Harold's support in his claim to be crowned King of the English, or he may have seen it as his duty to release Harold, as Harold was a vassal of William's kinsman, Edward the Confessor. Either way, Harold was released and taken into William's protection. Harold then accompanied William to Brittany, where William was marching in support of a claimant to the ducal throne of Brittany. It is during this campaign that apparently Harold rescued two of William's knights from the quicksand. William took the opportunity to knight Harold, presenting him with arms and armour. So this could be seen as William following the code of chivalry and presenting Harold with an award for his act of bravery and support of William's men. Also it could be seen as an opportunity taken by William to butter up Harold and gain his support. Norman sources also claim that Harold pronounced his support for William. The Bayeux Tapestry shows this happening in the crypt of a Norman church. Apparently, Harold swore on divine artefacts that he would support William's claim to the English throne. It is likely that Harold, if he did actually indeed pronounce his support for William, did this under duress. So it's important now to have a look at the succession of kings in England. Anglo-Saxon England was an elective monarchy rather than a hereditary monarchy. The succession was actually decided by the council known as the Witan. The succession was not decided by who was the eldest living son of a reigning king, it was actually decided by the Witan. However, if an Anglo-Saxon king were influential and powerful enough, his choice of who would succeed him would normally be accepted and the Witan would go through the formality of picking that person to be king. As mentioned earlier, there was growing concern over the Norman influence on King Edward. Edward had a dynastic connection to Normandy through his mother, Emma of Normandy, and she was the daughter of Richard I, Count of Rouen. At this time in 1065, Edward was seen as a weak king, and he had little respect amongst the Witan, so therefore he had little influence over who would become king after him. Even if Edward had made it known that his chosen successor was William, the Witan had no reason to abide by this. And given the fact the Witan were a tad anti-Norman, it is not surprising that they did not pick William. Following a long illness, Edward died on the 5th of January 1066. Harold Corpenson acted quickly to secure the throne for himself. A section of the Bayeux Tapestry shows Edward on his deathbed with Harold by his side. It is claimed that Edward awoke from his coma shortly before he passed and said to his wife that he entrusts the protection of England to Harold. So this statement can be taken any number of ways. It could be seen by Howard Godwinson that he was to be the next king of the English. William of Normandy may have seen it as Edward the Confessor entrusting Harold with the protection of England through a smooth transition from Edward to William. The 6th of January 1066 was quite a momentous day. Edward the Confessor's funeral was held, as was Harold's coronation as king of the English. Luckily for Harold, at this time, the senior nobles of England had convened in Westminster for the Feast of the Epiphany. So it was rather easy for Harold to influence the Witan in choosing him to be the next king of the English. William was incensed by what he perceived as Harold's betrayal. He almost immediately decided on a course for war. But let's step back and explore William's life up until 1066. It is claimed William's mother had a dream the night he was conceived. The dream went like this. A tree erupted from her womb and grew quickly to cover the whole of Normandy and continued to spread until it covered the whole of England. This seems like a somewhat outlandish dream. However, medieval Europe was a very superstitious place. Medieval propaganda played upon people's superstitions, and this is a perfect example of post-conquest propaganda to support William's seizure of the English throne. 
It is a dream that purports to show that William's destiny was to become Duke of Normandy and then later on King of the English. William was born in 1028 in Falaise, Normandy, to her laver of Falaise and Robert I, Duke of Normandy. William was born out of wedlock and so received the moniker William the Bastard. His parents never married due to the huge gulf between their social statuses. Her labour also bore two other sons, Otto and Robert, but they had a different father. It is thought that her labour may have been the daughter of a local burgher. A burgher was a person in medieval Europe who came from a social class that would generally be members of the ruling councils in towns and cities. So William's father, Robert I, died when William was just seven. By this time, William had been legitimised by his father, and having been nominated by his father to succeed him, as was accepted by the French king and nobles of Normandy, William dutifully became Duke of Normandy. However, due to his young age, he could not rule by himself. Having been nominated by his father to succeed him, which was also accepted by the French king and the nobles of Normandy, it is understandable that William assumed he would become king of the English following Edward's death. So it's also reasonable to assume that he had a legitimate reason to go to a war, to claim what he rightfully saw as his, the throne of England. When William was seven years old, his father died. As mentioned before, William had been legitimised by his father. However, due to his young age, William's guardians and other nobles in Normandy sought to influence and control him. It is known that a couple of William's guardians were killed during his infancy. Whilst William was staying in the castle of one of his nobles, a court jester who was a close friend of William overheard some nobles and assassins plotting to kill the young duke. The jester woke up William and told him to flee, which William did. So in 1037, William's great uncle, Robert, who was the Archbishop of Rouen, died. He was, at the time, William's most influential and powerful supporter and there followed what is known as the Anarchy, and this lasted until 1047. These ten years consisted of chaos in Normandy, in which various nobles sought to control the young duke. Three of William's guardians were killed during this time. In 1047, William was able to snuff out a rebellion at the Battle of Valais d'Une, with the support of King Henry I of France, when William was just 19. By this age, he was able to rule Normandy in his own right, without the need for guardians. The ending of the rebellion in 1047 greatly increased William's confidence and his power and influence. It also showed off his military credentials, a sign of strength that was needed in the medieval area. Even though the anarchy came to an end in 1047, William still had to deal with rebellions and uprisings until the 1060s, but this gained him more military, diplomatic and political experience. And following the end of the anarchy, he was able to consolidate his rule in Normandy, which then enabled him to expand his influence further afield, beyond the borders of his duchy. In 1050, William married Matilda of Flanders, and she was the daughter of Count Baldwin V of Flanders. William and Matilda had four sons, Robert Curtoz, future Duke of Normandy, Richard, William Rufus, his successor to the Kingdom of England, and Henry also another future king of the English. The couple also had a daughter called Adela, whose son Stephen also became king of the English, and we shall meet him in a later episode. Unfortunately for William, he fell out of favour with the King of France, Henry I. Henry I allied himself with Geoffrey Martel, Count of Anjou. At the Battle of Mortimer in 1054, and also at the Battle of Varaville in 1057, William was able to decisively defeat both Henry and Geoffrey, thus fully cementing his military prowess and securing the borders of Normandy, and also suppressing any idea of resurrection within. After this, William also extended his power into Maine, and recaptured the castle of Tillier, which had previously been lost to Henry I. William was now the most powerful ruler in northern France. And so it was that Edward the Confessor died in 1066, and William expected to be crowned as the new King of the English. As we know, this was not the case, so William set about raising a fleet and an army with which to seize the crown of England. He secured his duchy by giving special powers to his wife Matilda and their son Robert. It is also said that William received the support of Pope Alexander. With Normandy secured and its borders strong, William was ready to set out on a venture overseas. As we have seen, Harold Godwinson was crowned King of the English the day after Edward died, which also happened to be the day of Edward's funeral. The haste with which he acted points to the fact that he was wary that other claimants to the throne would come forward. And as we know, two came forward, Harold Hadrada, King of Norway, and William of Normandy. As previously mentioned, Harold Hadrada was influenced by Tostig Godwinson to invade England and attempt to seize the throne. So, in September 1066, 
Hadrada invaded the north of England with a large army that was transported in a fleet of roughly 300 ships. Setting sail for Scotland, Harold's fleets raided along the northeast coast of England and they made permanent landfall near Rickle on the River Ouse, from where they marched upon York, which was 10 miles north. At this time, Harold, King of the English, was with his army on the south coast of England, expecting a Norman invasion force to land. On roughly the 8th of September, he decided to disband his army as the harvest had to be brought in across England. The Anglo-Saxon army was mostly made up of the feud, an Anglo-Saxon feudal levy that consisted of a nucleus of experienced soldiers that would be supplemented by ordinary villagers and farmers from the shires, and their contingents also included the thanes, leaders of the shires. Another important part of the king's army were the house girls, and these were the king's personal bodyguard and elite troops, and they wielded big war axes. Upon hearing of Harold Hadrada's unexpected invasion up north, Howard Gobbinson immediately began reassembling his army, although the fleet he had was a tad more difficult to reassemble due to some ships being damaged in a storm following their release from service. Harold, king of the English, began marching north, recalling thanes and their men along the way. Harold's growing army marched day and night towards Northumbria in a week, which was approximately 200 miles. During the course of this week, the Earls of Mercia and Northumbria, the brothers Edwin of Mercia and Morca of Northumbria, were defeated by the Norwegians at the Battle of Fulford. Both Earls survived the battle, but many Anglo-Saxons were killed in the fighting. Little was known about the battle, except there were many casualties on both sides. The victors entered York the next day. It appears they were welcomed by the city's inhabitants, which is not wholly surprising given much of Northumbria were of Danish ancestry and appeared to prefer a Norse king rather than a king that hailed from southern England. Harold Hadrada planned to march south, but after securing hostages from York, he wanted to take more hostages before setting off on the march south. This was done in order to dissuade any further acts of aggression from Anglo-Saxon nobles in the north of England. On the 25th of September, 1066, Harold Hadrada and his army were encamped near Stamford Bridge, waiting for more hostages before they marched south. At this time, Harold, King of the English, had arrived just outside of York. The Anglo-Saxon army had drawn up in positions expecting to besiege the Norwegian defenders, but upon learning of the Norse army's position at Stamford Bridge, Harold Cobbinson marched his army through York and out towards them. The D Chronicle of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle describes the battle as a very stubborn battle. Clearly, the Norwegians had a very good defensive position. Due to it being a hot day, they were not wearing their mail shirts, although they were wearing their helmets. A 12th century story describes how a lone Norwegian soldier on the narrow bridge held up Harold's Anglo-Saxon army until a plucky Saxon went into a river under the bridge and drove a spear up between his legs, killing him. And this is all it is, a story. It could be an analogy of the stubborn resistance of the Norwegians defending the bridge. Eventually, fortune favoured the Anglo-Saxons and they fought their way across the bridge, and Harold Hadrada's army was defeated. Out of Harold's original 300 Norwegian ships, only a couple of dozen were needed to transport the survivors from England to Norway. Harold Hadrada was slain and buried in Norway. Tostig Gobbinson was also killed. Tostig could only be identified by a wart between his shoulder blades, the implication being that his face was too badly wounded to identify him. A funeral was held for Tostig in York, and it is most certain that Harold Gobbinson attended. So around the same time as Howard Hadrada's invasion, William was waiting to embark his army and set sail for England. The favourable winds meant his invasion was to be postponed. Fear not, Haley's Comet was in the sky for two weeks, which was seen as a sign that it was William's destiny to become King of the English. His army was camped at the mouth of the Dive River, and did initially set sail, but the aforementioned winds drove the fleet east to St. Valery at the mouth of the Somme River. It is thought before being blown towards the Somme, William intended to invade England via Hampshire near Southampton and march upon Winchester. And Winchester was the location of England's royal treasury, and whoever controlled the treasury controlled the country. As we know, William landed in Pevensey Bay. As a side note, it is thought a small band of Normans did indeed land in Hampshire at Fareham, and their mission was to march upon Winchester and seize the treasury. According to the esteemed historian Mark Morris, William's fleet consisted of roughly 700 ships. As soon as the winds of the English Channel were favourable, William set a course for England, and his fleet landed in Pevensey Bay on the 28th of September, three days after the Battle of Stamford Bridge. At this time, Howard Colpinson and his army were still up north. Pevensey Bay offered a protected landing site due to its curved geography. Also important is the existence of an old Roman fort, what is known as a Saxon shore fort, which he made use of. 
William's army also built a wooden fort which they used as a base of operations from where they conducted reconnaissance and gathered food and supplies. Upon hearing the news of the Norman landing, Harold gathered his army and marched south again, but this time it most likely took him two weeks to reach London rather than the one week it took to march north. Alderic Vitalis states Harold stopped in London for a week before moving on towards the Norman position near Hastings. During his time in London, monks were sent by both parties to negotiate. There was no decisive outcome and was most likely a round of verbal posturing between both sides. Each army knew of their opponent's general positions, but when Harold and his army arrived at St. Lac Hill on the morning of 14th of October, the timing of his arrival surprised the Normans, and there was a sudden rush to arms. It is thought Harold's army numbered somewhere in the region of five to 7,000 men, and these men all fought on foot. The Williams army consisted of cavalry, archers, and foot soldiers. As well as being made up from Normans, Williams army also consisted of Bretons, Flemish, French, and a number of mercenaries. William lined his army up in three lines of battle. The rearmost line were the cavalry. In front of them were the men-at-arms, and at the very front were the archers and crossbowmen. Harold drew his army up on St. Lac Hill in a shield wall. The battle began with a volley of arrows by the Normans, but this had little effect due to the effect of the slant of the hill, and the arrows did not reach the Anglo-Saxon shield wall. In return, the Anglo-Saxons launched a stream of missiles at the enemy archers, killing a few of them. So William realised his archers were not going to have the effect he intended. In response, he sent his infantry, which made a slow advance up the hill and clashed with the Anglo-Saxon shield wall. Harold's army put up a fierce resistance and were wearing the Norman infantry down. At this point, the battle was going in the favour of the Anglo-Saxons. William decided to send in his cavalry. The Anglo-Saxon shield wall was designed to withstand cavalry, especially on top of a steep hill. Coupled with rough ground, this ensured the cavalry charge had a much reduced impact and in fact a few of the Norman cavalry were killed by the Anglo-Saxons with javelins and the huge war axes swung by the house carls. The Norman cavalry repeatedly withdrew and charged again, and this went on for a couple of hours without breaking Harold's army. At one point in the battle, William's left flank, which consisted mainly of Bretons, began to retreat, and rumours abated that William had been killed. However, the Duke removed his helmet and confirmed to his army that he was still alive and fighting. Also at this time, the Anglo-Saxon right flank chased the Bretons down the hill, giving the Norman cavalry the chance to intercept them and cut them down. Another story goes that the Bretons feigned a second retreat after William revealed he was not dead, thereby opening up the right flank of Harold's army to be attacked. Either way, the Anglo-Saxon right flank was badly mauled by the Norman cavalry, and this was a turning point in the battle. The Normans were now mainly on foot, and they formed into one formation and marched up Sendlack Hill to Harold's position. William's archers were in the rear of this formation, and they were ordered to aim high as to hit the Anglo-Saxons. Harold attempted to reorganise the shield wall, but could not do so in a timely manner, and when the Normans reached the top of the hill, close hand-to-hand -hand combat resumed. Shortly after, another major turning point in the battle occurred, the death of Harold himself. And so it was that the last crowned Anglo-Saxon King of the English was killed. Amongst the dead were the flower of the Anglo-Saxon nobility and countless others. Harold's brothers, Leofwine, Earl of Kent, and Gerth, Earl of East Anglia, were also amongst the dead. This effectively ended the power of the Godwinson family in Anglo-Saxon England. There was contention as to whether Harold was killed by taking an arrow to the eye, or whether he was run through by a Norman horseman. The Bayer Tapestry shows a man with an arrow in his eye, and next to him there was another figure laying on the ground, being attacked by a Norman cavalryman. The words Harold Rex Interfectus Est hang over both figures. There is the possibility that both figures are Harold, representing him being hit by an arrow and then finished off by a horseman. After the battle, a few of Harold's men fought into the night before retreating into the darkness, and so William was the victor of the Battle of Hastings. This did not mean he was King of the English. William still had to subdue the Anglo-Saxon nobles, and there was also the issue of Edgar Atheling, the son of Edward the Confessor's nephew. Both sides suffered many casualties in the battle. However, William's army was still intact, and there was no army between him and London and the throne of England. I hope you enjoyed the first episode of this Bold Historian podcast. If you would like a transcript of this podcast, and a family tree showing the dynastic ties between Harold Hadrada, Howard Corbinson, and William of Normandy, send me an email to theboldhistorian at gmail.com. So if you have any hard of hearing or deaf friends or relatives, they can enjoy the podcast too. Thanks for joining me for this episode, and I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Goodbye.